Hi, and uh, welcome to the talk, uh, Be Brutal, which is uh, talk about controls architecture. First off, a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Stuart MacDonald, and I actually started my career in architecture, uh, strangely enough, in a brutalist architectural uh, school. After being an architect, I decided to move into video games and found myself at Rockstar North, where I worked as an environment artist and eventually became a lead environment artist, working from just after Vice City had shipped all the way through three Grand Theft Autos to Grand Theft Auto V. After that, I actually moved to Finland and I joined Remedy Games and worked on uh, American Nightmare and uh, was art director on Quantum Break. And finally, I was recently world design director on Control. So a little bit about what is a world design director. Um, originally, my, my job title in that, on that project was production designer, because it's something I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, it feels very close to architecture. But uh, in order to explain what a production designer does, we end up changing the world, changing to the title world design director. And really, a world design director is about production design. It's about setting the stage for, for a story and for game design uh, to play out on. And it's about building a potential space uh, and directing how the world looks. So what is Control? Um, for those of you who haven't played the game, Control is... a uh, set in uh, the US, it's set in a, in a building in New York, uh, controlled by the Federal Bureau of Control. And the hero of the game, uh, Jesse Faden, comes to the headquarters looking for answers to the mysterious events of our childhood. And the entire game is actually set in, inside this one building. And, and the Bureau itself investigates supernatural activities in the world. And um, the, the building itself, the interior, is, is mostly one kind of uh, government bureau, but then there's some other spaces that we kind of explore in the game that add some surprise. So the, the bureau headquarters is known as the oldest house. Uh, that's the kind of particular term that the, the bureau itself uses uses for the headquarters. And it's a strange place. It's, it's uh, it's, it's got a kind of endlessness to it. Um, and then we actually wanted something that would feel governmental to begin with and then gradually expand out as the player explores its uh, reaches. Best way to actually explain the, the, the oldest house is actually to show you the, the world trailer that we released during production. And in itself, it actually explains and gives some insight into what the oldest house actually is. Peggy 18. August 4th, 1964. Bureau agents discover the oldest house investigating an altered world event case in the New York City subway tunnels. It's a place of power. From the outside, it looks like an ordinary building, a brutalist skyscraper. But inside, it breaks the laws of our reality. Unstable, mad, shifting. There are rooms in the building where other dimensions begin. We call these rooms thresholds. There is a connection between our minds and the unknown, often hostile forces intruding on our world. These forces gravitate toward everyday objects, a gun, a television, a house with a reputation of being haunted. So somehow, we affect these events. We're holding the key, but we don't have a clue on how to use it. We're dealing with dangerous, unknown forces here. What's the cause and what's the effect? Are we the starting point, or just a necessary evil of this? We're on a mission to find answers to these questions. Or die trying. This is Zachariah 
Trench, the director of the Federal Bureau of Control. So as the video said, um, the Federal Bureau of Control's headquarters is uh, from the outside appears like a, a brutalist skyscraper in New York. And this is one of the early matte paintings I did to establish that concept. So it's a faceless uh, skyscraper placed right in the center of New York. And strangely, it's actually, there is actually a real faceless, brutalist skyscraper in the center of New York. And that's known as the Long Lines Building. And this was one of our references originally for the oldest house. Um, the reason for it being being the, the design it is, is because it's actually not meant for people. It's a telephone exchange center and it was built during the Cold War and, and apparently is designed to survive a nuclear attack. But there's this, it's a sinister monolith that, that people find in, the, in New York. Um, and it's actually connected to NSA conspiracies and was recently seen in TV shows such as Mr. Robot uh, itself as a data center. So it has this kind of, uh, reputation around it that really kind of suited as a reference for us. So the architectural style of the game is brutalism. And it was actually our game director, Michael Kasurinen, that initially suggested the style. And it felt like a really good choice for a strange government bureau's home. And uh, brutalism itself is a, a style that's recently regained popularity and, and it has quite a lot of photography on Instagram and there is a certain sort of cultural attention towards brutalism these days. Um, so really before we kind of dive into controls version, what I'll do is take you through a little primer about what is brutalism. Originally it was uh, Le Corbusier, who's uh, perhaps the most famous architect of the last century. He coined the term beton brut which was uh, to do with the expression of raw concrete and this honesty of material philosophy. And uh, from that, uh, architects uh, Peter and Alison Smithson, they started to de design a style known as brutalism. And uh, it predominantly spread across Europe as a form of social housing, uh, particularly in the UK. And there's still some standard examples that remain the style is highly sculptural and it looks more at massing and composition and it has a clear structural and functional expression and also the aforementioned honesty of materials. After that, the style moved out of Europe. Um, it became, it spread internationally. Uh, in particular in North America, it became adopted for university buildings and eventually government buildings. Uh, for instance, this is the Andrews Building in Scarborough College in Toronto. And this was one of our main references for the game. It's, you'll see it looks quite familiar and, and similar to the architecture of control. And it's used as a location for a lot of movies as well, like Shape of Water actually used this as a, as a shoot location. And also Boston City Hall. So the architecture moved into uh, institution and then government. So uh, Boston City Hall is another great reference that we use, and I'll talk about a little bit more of that later on. And finally, it was adopted by, by government as a whole in the US, so uh, people can associate brutalism with, for instance, the FBI headquarters uh, in Washington. There's a lot of examples in Washington. So that is the great thing. Brutalism has this association with government, so it actually solidifies its choice as, as something for the Bureau. But it wasn't just, uh, wasn't just what happened in the real world, also media uh, and film in particular has adopted brutalism as a, a shorthand for dystopia and, and, and the future. So you have this use of brutalism and, and, and uh, uh, for instance, Clockwork Orange by uh, Stanley Kubrick. Um, and we'll talk about Stanley Kubrick a little bit more later on because he's quite a large influence on some of the composition and architecture and control. So with the, the building itself being a, a monumental, brutalist uh, structure, one of the terms we kind of used for it was prison for the weird. And uh, that, that kind of really kind of fitted the, the, the kind of uh, 
the intent for the building because this is a place for a bureau that investigates the paranatural, as we like to call it in, in a remedy. They investigate these events in the outside world and they bring them back to the oldest house in order to contain them, but also to study them and learn from them. So this term prison for the weird can really kind of uh, give us a, a starter for how, how we might want to approach the architecture and the brutalism and the sense of solidity and power that the, the building would represent. And we also had this concept that Sam, our creative director, has for the collective subconscious or unconscious, where belief in certain archetypes actually have supernatural power. And you can see that in, in the objects of power within, within the oldest house itself. But also it means that this place as a prison for the weird, the, the solidity and strength of brutalism almost gives that sense of security to the occupants uh, and, and the sense of uh, protection. And um, the thing with brutalism as well is that there's another theme that we run through the game. Which is, uh, which is a theme of contrast. Uh, we're concentrating on the word weird. Um, uh, we had the, the concept of the new weird, but how do, we, how do we show weird? How do we communicate strangeness? And uh, one of the things we looked at is, uh, is this theme of contrast. Uh, much like horror movies, it, the scares are only, the, only built up by this, this feeling of anticipation or this foundation. It's the same thing with weirdness or strangeness that we actually have to build this foundation in order to have the strange or have the weird uh, and drive contrast. So you'll see this kind of thematic of contrast run through the world where we have order and chaos, the mundane, which is the, the functions and, and the, the very nature of a bureau and a government, a government bureau, and then the weird. And then things like the, the Bureau and the Hiss itself and, and one's very much to do with order and, and uh, understanding the other things, the other ones to do more with chaos and, and, uh, and fluidity visually. And then we have stability and entropy as well, this feeling of chaos. And that also is expressed in the, uh, in the destruction and in, in the, the comprehensive destruction we have in our gameplay where... Uh, where the, the world is very ordered and then through the gameplay and the actions of the player and, and the combat, we end up with entropy, end up with chaos in the world. This is one of the early concepts when we were talking about contrast and the weird. Um, and this is a water cooler delivery uh, worker. And this is met with this concept that we had of, of the bureau being a shifting place, much like the book House of Leaves at the the, as a, an inspiration that the oldest house actually shifts and changes. And uh, another way of illustrating this concept of, of weirdness or, or how we build a foundation of, of the mundane and then, and then we turn it on its head or provide surprise was this illustration where, where you have the functions of an office or a bureau, uh, everyday functions, and it meets this kind of strange event where the building shifts itself. And another early concept, exploring shifting, which was become more and more a, a larger feature of the game. Um, this is uh, also exploring this kind of concept of subtle shifting, where there's a story here that the rangers in the, in the bureau, they actually, the bureau looks to survey and resurvey the, the building and the world in order to understand how it shifts and changes and to map out the world as, as it moves around. Um, you can actually see there's a story in this where there's a, a section of rangers that, that map out the world and they go missing and then there's a se second um, group that are sent to look after them, look for them. So this is the kind of more subtle shifting in the strangeness of the world that we had, but obviously we needed something more dramatic um, and a larger payoff for the player elsewhere. So taking the shifting concept, uh, we had the concept of the hiss invading and sort of infesting the very sort of structure of the oldest house. So we had this much greater kind of a degree of shifting in the world where uh, we wanted a bigger payoff for the player. So uh, this, was, this was something we investigated with our art director, Yannick Bolkanen, and one of our VFX artists, uh, James Totman, uh, we looked at producing this more coral-like and organic growth 
um, that the Hiss has kind of has Hiss is kind of enforced on the world. And uh, using Houdini, we actually kind of worked out a system to be able to kind of process the geometry of the shells of each of these rooms and cre create this more recursive and obsessive uh, growth in the world to create caverns in a more chaotic, naturalistic vibe out of, out of the spaces. And this is one of the places where, again, contrast the brutalism, the, the solidity and, and fortress-like nature and, and imperviousness of the, of the, the concrete was actually challenged by this kind of sense of growth and movement. So contrast played a large part of this. And you can see that, that in our shifts. So back to the subject of the, uh, of the uh, talk in, in general, the Be Brutal. One of the things that, that I did for the, for the environment team, uh, most of my work is involved with the, the level designers and the, the environment artists. Part of the work for communicating uh, what is this architectural style and, and how we actually give the, player, give the artist the toolkit in order to produce this world was a, a small deck uh, called Be Brutal. And really what I did is reduce the architectural style of, of control down to, down to a few key points uh, as a guideline. And the concept is to give the artist a toolkit in order to learn the architectural style and be able to apply it themselves. Um, so this deck itself was, was very few slides and, and a few key points. So what I'm going to do is take walk you through that and actually expand upon it and give you the examples and explain a little bit more about how the world came to be. So the first point we had was mass. And uh, this is the expression of heavy pressing mass and forms and low and wide openings under tall surfaces. One of the defining features of, of brutalism you see is this kind of sense of, of, of mass and, and how it's actually expressed. I mean, concrete itself is a kind of heavy substance, but then it's accentuated by how they design the spaces. Um, and as the composition and, and the, again, the kind of design is something that we use to kind of express that. Possibly the best example of that is uh, there's one of the earliest spaces actually designed for control, which was the, the boardroom for the bureau. And this was the focal point for the bureau. This was the court for the director to rule over. So it's a place of focus and decision making. So I started working with this concept of a pressing mass over the table to add pressure and intensity to the space and where power plays out in the bureau. And this mass became a light box to add further drama and focus. Um, there's a note on one of the sketches that reads War Room, uh, which is actually leads me to one of the main references for this space, which is Stanley Kubrick's 1964 film, Dr. Strangelove. And this space was designed by perhaps one of the greatest production designers in film, which was Sir Ken Adam. Uh, he's a huge hero of mine and he's famous for his large James Bond sets of the 60s. But this, this concept of intensity and focus was an inspiration for Control's own boardroom. And here's a concept that, that really kind of tied it together. Uh, we raised a platform up for the boardroom in order to increase this sense of pressure and weight and bearing of mass. Uh, but also, if you look at the concrete walls surrounding, there's a, there's a play on traditional boardrooms with these kind of wood panelled uh, boardrooms, this kind of old uh, seat of power kind of concept, but then it's expressed in concrete too. And a lot of the executive sector, which is the kind of sector which these kind of places were in, uh, actually takes the visual stereotypes of wood paneling and, and brass and this kind of feeling of kind of executive richness and then plays with it. Another space that became a, a kind of great place of focus for the player uh, is the Sorry, um, yeah, the war room. Uh, this, is the, this is the kind of video of the war room. Next, I'll actually take you to the hub and explain how the hub came to be. So 
So the hub, um, the hub for the oldest house is, is an actually another good example of, of dominating a space with mass. And this is a bit more of a special case because it actually features one of Control's characters or, or motifs, which is the inverted black pyramid. The origin of the pyramid, somewhat hazy. Um, it, it came originally from art direction. Um, Yanni, our art director, had this uh, symbol at the start of production or pre-production, which was an inverted triangle. And I, I took that and actually put that into the concept of the hub as this inverted pyramid. And then it became a black pyramid. Um, and I really like this strange occultish symbology. Um, and from that, we eventually adopted it as, as, the, as the actual board for the, for the game. In fact, the first time you see the room, uh, fantastic job of the lighting artist, it actually reflects its roots again as this triangular symbol because the lighting reduces it to kind of a two-dimensional object sitting in the center of your vision. So we have the mass of the pyramid that bears over the Bureau's giant seal as well. It's a great seal of the hub. And uh, this, is, this ends up being something of a kind of a statement on the idea of the board and, and the Bureau. The other area of mass and the expression of mass and this kind of sense of fortification is, uh, is the Bureau's entrance itself. I originally, this is a concept, one of the first concepts I did for the, the entrance, which was this concept of almost a, of a slot that kind of punctuates the, the mass of the building. This is the, this is the only way to reach the outside world from, from the, uh, the Bureau. So again, the prison for the weird concept, the sense of thickness and weight and mass uh, as we have this kind of slot-like opening. And a lot of the inspiration from this comes almost from bunker architecture, this kind of defensible concrete architecture. Um, so the, the entrance is a slot piercing the solid mass and it shares this vibe of defense and, and it, kind of expression of strength and solidity, as I said before. Um, and it echoes that image of the building as a castle or prison for the weird. I'll return to bunker architecture later as it also played an influence later on in some of the architectural um, details on the, on the world. So the next uh, section uh, after this uh, we'll go into will be structure. So st structure, um, Again, the, the comment to the artist was use of large cantilever and open external internal corners on floors, express weight and size of beams and reduce size of columns. Actually kind of using structure as a kind of form of expression for the architecture. And again, an early concept exploring this uh, is this cantilevered beam hall, which you don't really see in game, but I mean, it, some of these concepts were just there to kind of communicate the concept to the, the, the artists when they started to create these spaces. And brutalism often plays with its use of concrete as a material. And it uses this boulder use and expression of structure. And that was a clear intent for us with the oldest house is to create these well-composed structural spaces uh, so there's structural logic and believability. Again, it's that idea of build the foundation in order to have the weird and strange. So we have to have this sense of solidity and believability to the space. And something that you can actually notice if, if you pay attention is, is the lack of structural columns in the world. I mean, there is columns in the game, but we actually deliberately steer clear of that a lot. Um, it only, not only creates freedom of movement, it also creates clarity of line of sight. So it really helps the game uh, navigation and, and, and gameplay. And it creates much clean, cleaner and readable volumes and forms in the world. Uh, for example, you can see that in open corners on floors and balconies and cantilevers stepping towards ceilings and the use of deep beams towards the bridge openings and support ceiling features. Which actually brings me to something I, I wanted to mention, which was how orthogonal the architecture is. And this is a deliberate move. Um, there was once something of a continual fight at times with, with, with the art team is to try and 
get them to avoid your use of angles and 45 degree angles because there was a real danger of us always slipping into this sci-fi trope. I mean, the kind of Sid, the legacy of Sid Mead, uh, where where we always break straight lines with with uh, 45 degree angles, and you can see that in games like Mass Effect. Um, and it's there's a subconscious trope there that we wanted to avoid. Uh, people were actually starting to feel this kind of very kind of gamma stick, um, sci-fi kind of vibe to the world. Again, we wanted to keep reinforcing the uh, mundane. Uh, and and kind of a uh, structural realism and truth to the world. This is probably the example of the largest structure in the game, which is the fire breaks. Um, they're actually huge cantilever beams and not actually a bridge. Uh, when you see them, there's actually a gap between them. And uh, fire breaks itself are an interesting concept. Early on, I had this this uh, concept of these impossible voids that would slice through the building and uh, create something of a supernatural firebreak. And uh, there would be another expression of mass uh, and the sense of this, uh, one of the concepts in the game was physicality and you can see that in telekinesis in the combat. So we had the concept of physicality, uh, which uh, is expressed here with this Egyptian tomb-like kind of masses that kind of seal off, off the firebreaks. And the fire breaks themselves are clad in black rock, which gives me another side story. Which is black rock. Uh, one of the things we needed in the world was some form of physical shielding or dampening um, to do with the physicality and the resonance, that, this concept of cosmic resonance in the world. So I discovered uh, this material in the real world called magnetite during my research. And it's interesting because uh, magnetite that's known as lodestone which is used both for occult divination, but also it's used in a powdered form for radioactive shielding and concrete. So I loved how this bridged the mystical and the scientific and uh, it used the shielding. Uh, so it gave it birth to the material and control, which we know is black, simply called black rock. And of course we needed somewhere for it to come from. So the concept of thresholds, which are the dimensions or places that bleed into the world, uh, I thought we could add a quarry. So we added a quarry in the threshold. But then again, with contrast, not only is it a surprise to find such a space, they also had the concept of introducing the starry sky. Um, so I have to really thank the concept artist, uh, Leo, who actually ended up hand painting a lot of these stars in order to really get the kind of punch on, on the starry sky. Um, and it was a good surprise to the player and it's quite a dramatic space for you to discover in the game. Other examples of structure is, uh, again, I mentioned the Boston City Hall. Uh, brutalism has this thing called a waffle ceiling you see often, uh, and uh, it's basically a kind of modularity and a modular structural ceiling. And it's something that I had actually used a lot in the, in the game design because uh, we used modularity a lot in order to leverage a, building a large world with such a small team. So there's explorations where I actually looked at how to how to kind of uh, retool this, this for different lighting scenarios and different ways we could actually kind of get more mileage out of the modules. In fact, ceilings become something of an architectural playground themselves in the game because they're not part of the actual kind of gameplay itself, except for maybe levitation. Uh, we had more freedom there. So you can see there's quite a lot of different approaches to how, how uh, the ceiling architecture is expressed. And then it also became a really useful thing when, when it came to lighting because we, we ended up integrating the lighting into more architectural approaches too. So depth, um, third one, depth, which is uh, the expression of thickness and depth in the walls, the tapered openings. And this is something you can see in a lot of brutalist architecture is that they really play with this honesty of materials and saying this is a dense material and, and there is thickness and mass here. And it, this is something that plays into that concept of, of a prison for the weird. In part, it's actually referencing uh, Scottish castles. This is something that Louis Kahn, one of the brutalist architects, actually studied as well, this concept of living walls where the ancillary spaces would actually be in the thickness of the wall. And the layout of the, of the actual game world is, is, is like this as well, where we have this concept of central spaces, almost like a village square and then the spaces grow out organically from that central space. 
So a lot of the sectors tend to have a central hub space like the, the research sectors, uh, spiraling staircase hub or the power plant and, and maintenance or the, indeed the, the game hub with the black pyramid and executive sector. So we have this concept of a large central space and then organic growth of the, of the more functional spaces for level design and gameplay expanding out from that. In fact, the research sector hub has some of this uh, thicker wall element, even within its design with this cascading uh, spiral staircase. This is an early concept where, again, with a sense of surprise, I wanted to introduce an element of contrast, which is the, the redwood trees. So there's a real kind of hit of the scale, the sheer scale of this space um, using that is something you don't expect to find there. And you can see the punctured windows and other ways that kind of express the thickness of this space. I mean, it's, it's where research is, so the, the kind of research spaces are hidden behind this thick wall of the, of the, the research center's hub. So surface, um, this is about the use of limited palette and surface textures, brutalisms, predominantly concrete. But we also paid careful attention to articulation and the change of surface. And this is something where it helps to re really um, ground the world. Texture itself, uh, we use a limited palette. If you look at brutalism itself, it, it uses concrete in many different ways and it really treats the surface in different ways. You have boarded concrete and combed concrete and, and, and other ways of actually, you can actually change the surface. And this is about the honesty of materials and construction again. It, brutalism doesn't hide how it's built. So uh, we actually built quite a large palette of, of concretes for, for the world. And obviously we needed contrast to that material as well, but well, we, we tried to introduce enough variety in that one material itself since it was going to be predominantly used throughout the world. And especially with the sense of destruction, we, you know, we wanted material that would be, the honesty of materials bled into ways we could actually see how destruction would work in the world and the player would in, intrinsically understand that. But it wasn't purely concrete, as I said. Um, one of the references was Louis Kahn, the architect, and this is his Yale Center. Um, and this is a really good reference for executive for us, where I had this mix of wood uh, and concrete. And this is something that I used as a early kind of palette concept for, for uh, executive, where you can see that the concept of wood and brass. And then we have this very ceremonial red carpet and laid into the, into the uh, space. And incidentally, the, the brass kind of details are actually influenced by another architect, which is Carlo Scarpa, who I'll come to later. And also as a relief, quite literally, to the limited material palette we developed, we also introduced a set of brutalist cast panels. Uh, this, this gave us some material difference and, and kind, of, uh, kind of really kind of added some focal points to some of the spaces. Next part of surface is really a sub part was articulation. As I mentioned, how surfaces would change and meet together. And you can see a, an example of the balance of surface articulation and texture in the real world references. On the left, it's the Andrews building, the, the one from Toronto University, which was a big influence and reference for us. And on the right, you can see an example from the communications area of the executive sector. And you can see, even though it's concrete, we've actually paid attention to where the structure is. You can see where the beams might be behind a wall. You can see this channeled concrete and then the smoothness of the structure. So we can still add expression and we can still add interesting surface movement and, and change, even without, without actually changing the, the material itself. And the lighting especially kind of helps with this. But this became one of the ongoing struggles with, with the art team and traditional, I would say, sort of game art, is uh, this teaching restraint to the artists on surface detailing, especially like wanting to add physical details, not just like differences between surface treatments. 
Um, if you think more architecturally and then concentrate on the form over surface, then you, you really want to strive to reduce too much detail and clutter. So uh, like stains and pipe work and cables and all the kind of all the kind of uh, minutiae that you would you would normally add to a lot of game environments, we, we deliberately try to avoid in order to give, produce these very clean architectural spaces. And that in itself is is that concept that quality is not always quantity, and it's something that technology is actually allowing us to explore now with games. I mean, now we have GI and, and we have the kind of the power of RTX and 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 uh, the ability to do sort of ray traced environments, then we can actually have more play of light on surfaces. So we can actually be more, much cleaner and architectural with how we treat spaces. I mean, these two examples are both beautiful churches in their own right, but one's Baroque and one's by uh, Tadeo Ando, who's, who's known as this master of light in architecture. They're both, one's very, very clean and the other one has this incredible uh, obsessional detail. But like I said, the architectural spaces can be quite valid now with the technology we have coming through. And actually with good technology, it also takes great lighting direction and our, our art director, Yanni Polkinen and the, art, the, the lighting team did an awesome job here. Um, the use of light and the actually integration of light into architecture so that those ceiling spaces, we actually had the, the lighting not as your traditional spots of light fittings, but we actually introduced it into the architecture. So they actually worked in harmony together. It really worked really, really well and, and they just did an awesome job here. And we had this uh, concept of uh, outside world and, and light flooding into the space. Uh, we've got this in, internal world, you mean you never see the outside world. So you need some psychological relief from that. So we actually looked at, at ways of, of integrating uh, ceiling lights and, and voids into, the, into the, the ceiling that would actually allow something that simulates daylight to actually flood into the space. And this, uh, this kind of helps add some relief psychologically to this oppressive internal space. Of course, you have places like the, the quarry that you find later on, but, but generally most of the space feels quite internal and, and, and we need these kind of sense of light in order to try, try and lift the, kind of, lift the kind of feeling of space. Another thing with, uh, with the concept of, of this cleanness and and clarity of space was the fact that we're building a game with comprehensive destruction. The uh, honesty of materials principle of brutalism really supported that as well. But it meant that it meant that actually the player would paint destruction and actually add this kind of entropy to the space anyway. So we had to have quite a clean start to, to begin with. And then the player could have this visceral pleasure in tearing these kind of very precise architectural spaces into, into pieces effectively. Okay, um, so the other thing is we're building this magical world. Oh, the M Warbers wasn't something really used in production, but this idea of a supernatural kind of world, and that involved some sense of ritual and ritualized architecture. Uh, and how we would express this, this feeling of the occult in the world. And one of the ways we did it was element five, which is repetition. And you see this in brutalism as well, there's repetition and structural rhythm, and it reinforces that architectural strength of brutalism, but also introduces this concept of ritualism. So the reference I mentioned before, Carlo Scarpa, he was a concrete architect, not necessarily a brutalist one, but he's known for his detailing and bringing decorative elements into the concrete architecture. And I actually remembered uh, one of his, his uh, designs had this ritualized, very kind of um, stepped architecture, it's the Brion Cemetery. And it was interesting that the steps would turn up the wall um, and there was other el elements of it uh, introduced into the architecture. And I found this like really kind of introduces this kind of element of strangeness to the, to, the, to the architecture and it's something we could really adopt. 
And again, talking about bunkers and this, uh, this concept of fortification, prison for the weird, is the bunker architecture has embrasures. Um, and this is this form of stepping uh, and kind of uh, reinforcement of, 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 of the spaces. So, so this architectural feature of, of defensibility and then also the decorative feature from, from Carlos Scarpa, we brought together to try and introduce something that would feel ritualized and almost an obsessive element, decorative element to this honesty and simplicity of, brut of brutalism. So the one particular space we started to apply it was, was the hub itself. And you can see these large decorative columns that grow out of the, the stepping towards the central seal. And also this, this embrasure-like architecture can be seen when you, when you pass through to the boardroom, which is the, that central heart of the bureau itself. And you can see this mo architectural motif applied in a number of places, such as the ritual hub in the research sector and numerous doorways and staircases throughout the oldest house. So element six, symmetry. Symmetry and balance reinforces architectural strength of brutalism and controls the viewer. Um, this was the, the concept of ritualism again that we're introducing. You can see in cathedrals and churches and the idea of controlling the viewer. And one of our references again was Stanley Kubrick. And he's famous for the one point perspective. It's meticulously framing his shots in film and it adds this feeling of strangeness and expression of intent outside the reality it attempts to portray. So films like The Shining use it famously for a particularly unsettling supernatural atmosphere. And it was a great opportunity for us to sort of use that as a reference and an inspiration for our spaces within the oldest house. And it, it, its use represents a loss of control that reduces your choice to two dimensions effectively, forward or back. Um, and this is something also used in maze motifs that you can see in the world as well, which is this idea, concept of control. So you can see the one point perspectives, actually this processional approach is used in a number of places in the oldest house. And it elevates that sense of the mundane and the ordinary to something stranger. And you can see, see it in the director's office this is a very early concept of the director's office. In fact, the carpet motif is, is, is inspired by the, the maze from, the, uh, from Shining. And again, and in, in things like the furnace room is this, is this almost like a temple uh, kind of architecture where, where it's raised and, and it's on this, it's almost like a Mayan temple where you have this procession that kind of takes you to the, to the furnace itself. And also in, in the uh, mail room itself, it's, um, this is a cathedral of information. So there's this procession and approach device which kind of helps elevate the meaning of space. And incidentally, the pipe mail trees are part of what I've termed technological lore. Um, that's another part of world design where I actually try to kind of uh, come up with a philosophy that informs everything that goes into the world and then Control's uh, example, it was the idea of physicalized information because uh, there was, we had this belief that it would be more, and the Bureau itself, that it would be less subject to the forces at play within the oldest house if information was physicalized. That's why you don't see so many emails and computers. And I believe when you go in the, the entrance at the start of the game, you can see a security check where people actually check in their phones. So bringing it all together, um, let's conclude the architectural style for control. And uh, there was a concept that I produced, which you don't actually see in game per se. Uh, it did inspire the ritual hub, but this space doesn't actually really exist. It was there for illustration purposes to bring all these elements together. So we had the concept of mass and this idea of bearing and pressing down in the space. And then structure, so you have these kind of repeated, repeated beams. Incidentally, you can actually see the triangular symbol from early on in pre-production here for the Bureau that became eventually the pyramid itself. And then we have the concept of depth, this, this opening, this doorway punctures through this much, much thicker kind of space. 
and the the idea of surface, this, the honesty of surface, and and not not being too fussy with the surface, and actually expressing the material and being honest. This honesty of material we have and concept and in brutalism, and again repetition. This is where the ritualistic architecture comes in. We have the stairs turning up onto the beams and. And this kind of a strange kind of stepping architecture appearing in, in places in the space. And finally, we have symmetry. The idea was you would maybe approach the space from the left hand side off camera towards that doorway at the end. So you would have a symmetrical, more processional approach into the space. So as part of the conclusion, I, I thought I would try and sum up how I approach this, these kind of concepts of world design or what's the kind of three kind of guiding principles that I usually do when I approach world design. There's no magic here. I mean, a lot of it's just hard work. Um, but I think the three things I would maybe cover would be the concept of casting the net wide. And this is something many projects do, but something you have to re really pay uh, particular attention to is is search wide and deep for your references and inspirations, um, especially when you're dealing with art and, and world design and architecture itself. Uh, you really should consciously, and we do this in Remedy, we try to consciously avoid referencing other video games. I understand that for things like game design because that is the medium they work in, they need to reference other video games. But we're creating spaces, we're creating worlds, we're creating art, there's a world out there of references and it will only make your world deeper and richer. Um, even if it's not expressed directly to the player, subconsciously they'll, they'll feel this richness and this considered approach to, to world design. So really in particular, we always, I always look towards um, like installation art and architecture and, and other references that I can actually pull into the world design. Again, you see examples of that with the black rock how it came from, from magnetite. It's, there's actually a, sort of, uh, a logical kind of a set of researches behind what, how that came to be. Um, so spend the time, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's difficult, but spend the time to, to really kind of try to grab as much reference as possible. I think this is something I really learned from GTA where we would, for our, the next GTA, we would spend like months researching and then finally culminating in a field trip where we would take vast amounts of photographs and visit large areas of the city we intended to build. And I think that really gave me a good education in how to, how to do this kind of very kind of deep and considered uh, reference work. Focus on form. Um, there's a tendency a lot of time in the industry to die straight into details, I think, when we do the world design or, or the kind of environmental design. Um, and there is, there is a sort of uh, culture of obsession with detail in our game, in our games. That's why, you know, we have photogrammetry and we have this obsession with kind of realism and, and how much the details are, but without paying attention to the overall form and composition and, and the bigger picture and those broader brush strokes, you're not really laying the foundation for that detail to really kind of work. So pay a large attention to the focus on form and architecture and how the world sits together. Um, and this is something, like I said, that we have this opportunity now with technology to do that. And so don't fear simplicity and concentrate on the form and lighting. And again, like I said, on that note, trust the lighting team to make a beautiful final image. And we were lucky with our, our engine technology and a hugely talented team to be able to do that with control. And the last one is um, really relates to, I have a particular dislike of the, word, the term art bibles. I don't really believe in art bibles, particularly for the team because uh, one, artists tend to have a tendency not to read them uh, and another, it's that concept of uh, teach a man to fish is that you should really build a toolkit and, and give, give the guidance and, and, and the, the simple principles for a team in order to be able to do their work um, and be there for them when they, when they need extra guidance. So it's that concept of direct, not dictate. So really try to simplify what, what you're doing and what you want expressed in the world into a set of clear guiding elements, build that potential space for your art team. I mean, it's a team effort. We have a really talented environment art team in-house and uh, 
and like I said, talented lighting artists, a great art director. Trust your team to really kind of kind of produce produce the work. Um, so build, give them a toolkit to do that and trust them. So uh, yeah, that's that's the three things. Um, the other thing is making a weird world is fun, but harder than you think. And again, that principle we used of contrast really helped. Thank you.